It is the end of World War I. To Italy, victory has brought depression and disorder. Yesterday's heroes are jobless and hungry. There are strikes, communists who preach revolution. There is a liberal government that temporizes. This is destiny's hour for a glib blacksmith's son, who in turn has been pacifist, school teacher, journalist, and rising socialist. With war, he turned super patriot. With peace, he promises order, pride, territory. His price is power. His panacea is fascism. His name is Benito Mussolini. To him and to fascists, a million men, angry men, alarmed industrialists, disillusioned veterans. Armed fascism takes the offensive, breaks strikes. Mussolini delivers an ultimatum. Hand over Italy or we seize it. October 28, 1922, while Mussolini cautiously remains behind, bolder fascists march on Rome. Two days later, Mussolini arrives to become premier, called by King Victor Emmanuel, who prefers fascism to civil war. Within a month, Mussolini turns dictator. Soon the little king comes to hate Mussolini, his bad manners, bombast, broken promises, but grudgingly he does the duce's bidding. Mussolini plays the selfless leader, pushing public works, creating jobs, turning the Pontine marshes into green farms. Hungry Italy needs leadership. This is the honeymoon. Italy rebuilds, grows healthy, but public adulation is corrupting her leader, converting Mussolini's cynicism into self-confidence, then egomania. To him, Italy has become his own. The man who plays with lions is balding, far-sighted, harassed by war wounds, agonized by ulcers, and orders this cub to a zoo when she scratches him. But fascist Italy must be tough, athletic, virile. He plays his role with an actor's dedication. Italy believes the propagandist myth. So does Mussolini. His family life makes good propaganda. His wife, Rochella, is a simple hometown girl, bears him three sons and two daughters. Mussolini is an unfaithful husband, but fond parent. The public sees the man on horseback, not fascism's savage other face. Black shirts brutalize the weakening democratic opposition. In 1924, they murder socialist Giacomo Mattiotti, who speaks out for freedom. Italians are outraged, and Mussolini wavers, indecisive, fearing overthrow. But the anti-fascists fail to act. The beatings and burnings continue. The power solidifies. And through all of this, that essential of totalitarian rule, propaganda, unending propaganda, through every medium, forever shrilling the power of great leader and super state. February 1929, Mussolini, the anti-cleric, the half-believer, formally recognizes the Vatican as a temporal state. But this can be only a truce, for fascism says man belongs to the state, not to his god. The superficial face of fascism impresses many Americans. Now the trains run on time. Italy has discipline, direction. Privately, Mussolini calls the United States a mongrel nation. Publicly, I salute the great American people. I greet the wonderful energy of the American people. And I see and recognize among you sons of your land as well as ours, my fellow citizens who are working to make America great. 
Mass idolatry turns Mussolini, politician, into Mussolini reincarnated Caesar. He dreams of conquering a new Roman Empire. For this, Italy needs soldiers. So Mary, have babies, more babies. Mussolini asks it. The state rewards it with lira. Be patriotic, breed. The goal is total indoctrination from childhood to the soldier's grave. Fascism crams young minds with Italy's destiny and the beauty of war. Each boy must bear a bayonet. By the mid-30s, Mussolini boasts that Italy has eight million bayonets. In 1934, an imitator meets Mussolini for the first time. Adolf Hitler, still uncertain in his new role of Führer, has borrowed openly from fascism and idolizes Mussolini. They meet at Straw, near Venice. The Ducci treats his shabby admirer with easy superiority. Tolerantly, he listens to Hitler's plea for closer ties, then less tolerantly, as Hitler rants of Nordic superiority. Certain he can dominate him, the Ducci later calls this strange German a madman. Humiliated, Hitler plans revenge against Mussolini's good friend, Chancellor Dolphus of Austria. On July 25, 1934, the Dolphus children romp with the Ducci's children at Mussolini's estate. At this moment, in Vienna, Austrian Nazis shoot Dolphus and let him bleed to death. Dolphus is buried and Mussolini, furious at Hitler, orders his troops to the border to intervene for Austrian freedom. The Duchy frightens the Fuhrer. Unready for war, Hitler disowns his agents. The putsch fails and Mussolini gets the credit. Europe hails the Duchy as the savior of the peace. At Streza, France and Britain join him in an anti-German front. And now Mussolini offends the world. On October 2nd, 1935, he orders his people to war against Ethiopia. The enemy is half-clad, ill-armed, ruled by Emperor Haile Selassie. A backward but proudly independent African people, their fathers had overwhelmed Italian aggressors in 1896. Mussolini promises Italy vengeance and empire. And so 170,000 Italians go to war, as Italians will do until fascism is consumed by the wars it glorifies. It is a small, safe war, the kind Mussolini likes. Even Bruno Mussolini volunteers. At the League of Nations, Italian diplomats boo Haile Selassie. It is, it is Majesty's Nicholas Haile Selassie. I call upon the first delegate of Ethiopia. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le... Mkhnayatun nu wattad de mtu bondu bord de ka gizie gazun nafas ki wos de gres mabtatatun sila wo kubatno. Mussolini turns his little war into an exercise in national discipline and sacrifice. Women obediently trade gold wedding bands for steel. Wedding rings buy bombs. Unopposed Italian air power ranges over defenseless villages. Pilot Vittorio Mussolini tells how his bombs bloomed like a deadly rose on Ethiopian columns and says, war is the quintessence of beauty. In 1936, Mussolini has won Ethiopia and doomed the League of Nations. Roma, aveva Cesare, Virgilio e Augusto. 